Okay. So good evening, everyone. My name is Doug Latimer, and I'm the lead guide for the Alpine Club of Canada. Well, the lead winter guide. And uh, just uh, as I get started, I just want to check. Are you getting uh, the audio feed nice and clear? Do I need to turn it down? Is it working? Um, I just had to go through an extra security check and I just want to make sure everything is running. As far as I can tell, it looks good. So if you uh, would be so kind as to use the chat and let me know. Excellent. Thanks, uh, thanks, Louis. <clears throat> so this is uh, the first uh, public presentation for the ACC this fall. Uh, we're hoping to put these together and uh, basically offer um, you know, a series of three or four uh, live streams every spring and every fall and uh, go through a fairly wide range of subjects about uh, basically winter mountain travel. I'm doing these first four, but as we sort of build it up, we'll certainly be bringing in other people, um, professionals and experts uh, in various disciplines. And uh, hopefully that uh, we're able to maintain this program for, for some time. So with that said, Let's get started. Um, I'm going to send in my... No, I'm not going to. I'm not going to type in my cell phone number. It's just probably asking for it. Because this is going to be on for the long term. Okay, so... Oh, I forgot the wrong title. Just finished making this. This is uh, basically an introduction to ski touring. So, if you have any questions, just type them in through the chat. And uh, I'll check it fairly regularly and uh, I can answer your questions as we move through. But basically, ski touring is really quite an amazing uh, sport. For lack of a better word, it's almost a lifestyle. And it's something you can do at a very easy, moderate level. It's something you can do quite aggressively. Everything in between. And one of the really amazing things, what I truly love about ski touring, is how it expands over time. You start off by doing some nice, simple tours, and you really just need to know how to move on your skis. You get into bigger terrain, and now you're working on your downhill, your alpine skiing techniques. As um, your desire grows, you might be doing longer days. The terrain gets more complicated, so now you have to develop some navigational skills. As you keep moving, you realize it'd probably be nice to know about the avalanche hazard, and so you start building avalanche skills as well. Those work out very nicely, and... The navigation and the avalanche skills will constantly keep you thinking. And then suddenly you realize that it's really all about the weather. So you learn more about weather. Meanwhile, you're moving through the landscape, trying to figure out the best routes up. And uh, eventually you reach a point where, not many, but some of us will actually start thinking, it'd be nice to go for more than a day. And so you start doing multi-day trips. And you're out for the weekend, you're out for a week. Uh, I think the longest trip I've done, self-sustained, was about eight or nine days uh, without food caches or huts. And you start getting into some really incredible remote places, which is just amazing. And when you extend the season, you get up higher, you go on glaciers, you travel on ice fields, and suddenly you're looking at building your skills on glacier travel and crevasse rescue. And you just keep upping your game throughout. And I think probably what has most people sort of worried about is when you get the whiteouts. You're up on big terrain, it's large, glaciated country, and now you can't even see where you're going. Uh, the Wapta and the Columbia Icefield are famous for this. And that's another whole different layer of challenge, and so it never ends. Today, when I go to the ski hill, and I don't do it very often, maybe once every three or four years I'll buy a lift pass, and I'll do a day of, stay of skiing just so I learn how to ski properly again. And what I really notice is it's exciting for the first run or two, and then I slowly get bored because as soon as I'm off the run and I'm in line and taking the lift up, I can turn my brain off. And ski touring is one of those things that you're just constantly looking around, thinking and assessing and considering. It's I find it just, just a really enjoyable experience. And my family has gotten into it as well. And this is what I mean by it doesn't have to be some big onerous event. This is my son. He's seven years old. And he's following our spouse, my spouse, in the backcountry. At 12, we did the walk to Traverse. Here he is at 14. We're doing the Spray Range Traverse in Kananaskis. He's just bopping along. 
having a wonderful time. And that's fairly big avalanche feature that he's skiing down. And he really enjoys that. I don't get to get out to with him too often because I'm always guiding, but when we do get out, he really enjoys just going out, skiing some nice powder lines, and this is his first summit. Um, ski Mountaineering, he was 12 years old. And uh, as a family, we reached it to the top of the peak, and we had a really nice trip. But at the end of the day, this is something that I've struggled with, because you do get into big terrain, and you do get into some fairly serious consequences. And then people are kind of thinking, well, this is getting too dangerous. And it shouldn't. There are ways to manage risk. And for years, I've gone into the backcountry, and I've worked with other guides, or I've just skied with friends, and there's been times when I've heard people say, you know, that was a lot of fun, but don't tell my family. <laughs> or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's okay if we do this, but I'd never let my kids here. And I understand what they're saying on the one hand, but on the other, I can also look at the other side of the equation. When I was young, I lost my mother. And you know what? It's pretty bad. Um, that's the wrong word. It was, I cannot imagine losing my son. I will never place him in a level of risk that I think he could be killed. It just terrifies me. And having lost my, having lost a parent, it's just as devastating, I suspect, for the children to lose a parent. And so when you move in the backcountry, we shouldn't be thinking, you know, well, this is too dangerous. We should be thinking, this is a lot of fun. And I've got some nice margins here. And so I am comfortable with what I'm doing. And if you're not, it's time to step back and reassess. Because you know what? I don't think any of us goes into the, well, that's not true. I do, I've done this and I know people who have. You don't normally go into the backcountry looking for something that is a threat to your survival. And you can travel in big places and do bold things and long trips with the same kind of margins and comfort that you would accept um, with your family. Taking my son out of the backcountry is more dangerous than driving him to his grandfather's. But it's not that much more. And I need that level of comfort and that level of margin whenever I take somebody out. Because I'm not looking to test my limits to see how far I can go before I kill myself. And I think most of us are like this. We're going out to have fun. And there are ways to really manage this and enjoy yourself. So that's really the key, and that's what I think is one of the, the beauties of ski touring, is there's always options. And yes, you know, stuff happens. This is a trip I was, uh, I was teaching a few years ago, early on in the pandemic. And as we were looking around, I had my GoPro going. I looked across, and then I notified my group that we had an avalanche. Now, I put a big enough buffer between myself and those slopes that I was confident the debris wasn't going to reach me. However, the powder cloud, which you can see moving, did have enough force to reach us, and that didn't really worry me from a safety point of view, but I was concerned because it's going to be a bit disturbing to my guests who've never been on a glacier before, and now they're seeing this cloud of snow. And so it does take a fair bit of skill and time to develop what you need to sort of know where the boundaries are, because whenever I make a decision now, and I've been doing this for a long time, in the back of my brain, I ask myself, if my son had the skills, would I let him come with me? And if the answer is no, then basically I find another route. Because I wanted to be able to come with me, and I want to be able to come back home to him. He's 20 now. He's on the phone talking to uh, my spouse. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really nice to have a family. But that's how I define my boundaries. And I try to be very conscious of it because we are moving through wild places. But the joys are incredible. Oh. Okay. Let's see how we're doing here. Okay, good. So when you're preparing for a backcountry ski trip, um, you got to go through all your equipment. And there's a basic checklist 
of the gear you need to go to go ski touring. And it's pretty straightforward, but let's take a look at it. So if you're going to go out for the day, here's got a good basic overview. So this big red thing is a tarp. And that tarp has basically got Velcro on both sides, so I can sort of stuff three people in there, and we can sit on our packs. It's good to have an extra down coat. So that's a coat on top of what I would normally have. So if somebody gets injured or didn't bring enough, you've got a good coat for them. A large first aid kit, not stupidly big, but enough to deal with the real situation. You're going to have to have communication, whether it's a VHF radio, a satellite phone, or an inReach. They're all very good. My personal preference is a satellite phone because they're really good. Navigation. You got to have uh, some way of navigating if you're going into a place that has any uncertainty or just unfamiliarity. And then take a little book with you. This is my guidebook. I've got the bulletin in there, emergency phone numbers. I'll actually photocopy and put a paper map with me because if my phone fails or there's issues, those actually work really well. I've got some emergency instructions in there and it's great. This is a slope meter. I actually carry one all the time because I will literally measure the slopes to make sure they're within reason. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. I print out a copy of the Avalanche Bulletin and I will read it to my guests every day and ask them how they feel about it too. Carry a repair kit. And this is pretty simple, but it's all you need. If you've got some specific things uh, unique to your touring system, bring them along, but that's a good general start. And then bring a snow saw. You can cut down uh, basically small trees, branches, and you can use it for uh, some snow study. Now, this is the group every individual needs to bring. Before this, that was shared amongst the group, but everyone needs to carry a shovel and carry a good shovel. Don't skimp on the shovel. They're huge. Probes, the new standard is everyone should have at least three meters. If yours is a bit shorter, don't sweat it, but we are getting live recoveries more than three meters deep when people are caught in avalanches. So it's good to have a full probe. Transceivers, doesn't matter which transceiver you have, they're all good. Choose the one you like. Carry a headlamp because I guarantee you some trips are just going to go longer than you thought. Everyone should have a headlamp. Make sure you've got uh, good gloves, good hat. It's even worth having a carry a spare pair of mitts. Wide mouth water bottle so if it starts to freeze you can still get water. If it's really cold take a thermos have some food. Oranges, if it's really cold, they're going to turn into ice, but if it's not so bad, you're okay. Taking a little extra toilet paper will make your life so much more pleasant. Um, <laughs> that one time you really need it. Skins, basically skins are what we stick on the bottom of our skis so we can go uphill. Skin, uh, ski crampons, I really only carry these in the spring. Um, I very rarely carry them when I guide simply because I always have guests who don't bring them and since I got to get everybody up uh, it's not much point in me having something my guests don't have and can't use. Take some sunglasses because it gets sunny. So these are sort of the basic um, tools that you're going to have in your pack. Now just to go back a bit um, I quickly went over the transceivers. You know any of the new three antenna transceivers are fine. So everything from the tracker to, to the latest and greatest is a, is a perfectly valid transceiver to carry. And they're good. They're all good. When people ask me which uh, unit they should buy, what I actually recommend is don't buy a transceiver yet. If you don't have one, don't buy one. What you need to do is you need to get out with a group of people who have different transceivers and see if you can actually try them. Try a bunch of different transceivers, because I think of it kind of like a marriage. I actually get pretty close to my transceivers, because they're important. And you don't run out and marry the first transceiver you see. you got to play the field. So what you do is basically you start dating various transceivers. Push their buttons. Play around with them a bit until you find that one transceiver that really does work in a way you're very comfortable with. And they do all work a little bit differently. So just find the one you like. And when you do, buy that transceiver and never touch another unit until both of you, until you both, for as long as you both shall live. That's what I want. And the reason I say that is because they all work a little bit differently, 
if you're not really good with your transceiver, should you ever need it, you may not actually be comfortable with it because you haven't got it dialed. Know that unit inside and out. And for years, I would actually buy the simplest transceiver on the market because I knew that under stress, I wasn't going to handle well with a fairly complex device. So that's what I chose. And other guides would tell me that, you know, this is the wrong transceiver to have. You can't do a proper search. Well, that's wrong. That is completely wrong. Last year, I was working with the Canadian Avalanche Association, and I was um, involved with their Avalanche Search and Rescue program. So we set up the exam for the students. These are people training to become professionals. We ran them all through, marked them. And just before we dug up the exam, I pulled out my stupidly simple transceiver. And I lined myself up, and I put myself to the same test that every one of the students had. So this is a professional standard. And what I found is that simple transceiver, I aced the exam. I scored 100% well under the required time to find basically the buried units. So they all work. They all work well. Uh, I have since purchased sort of the, the industry standard for professionals. It is a very nice unit. I was sort of forced to do that because 90% of professionals all use one beacon. And if I'm going to be an examiner, an instructor at a professional level, I need to be consistent with the industry. But the truth is, when I'm just guiding for myself, I usually bring the, little one, the very simple one with me. So don't get hung up on the transceiver. Find the one you like. My only advice is probably buy new. You don't know the history of a used transceiver, and these things are your life. So buy one, stick with it. Batteries, they're always alkaline. And uh, yeah, one thing that is really useful is put it on before you leave the house. You don't have to turn it on, but put it on. Otherwise, you get to the trailhead, you get all geared up, they do the transceiver check, and oh yeah. You pull it out of your pocket, you take all your clothes off down to your base layer, and while you're freezing in the cold wind, you're strapping this unit on. I put it literally on the pile of clothes I'm going to wear that morning, and I just put it on with all my layers, and when it's time to, uh, to use it, I just reach down, switch it on, put it back in its harness, and go. Oh, and use the harness. Lots of people put in their pet pocket. Industry best practices is on the harness on your chest, and that's what I use. It really isn't a hassle. Okay. So, just going again with the equipment very quickly. Avalanche transceiver, probe, shovel. Helmets are really good. All right. I cannot emphasize that enough. I grew up without skiing with a helmet. My generation, it wasn't even a thought. Um, it was introduced with a guiding program. I don't like it. It really bugged me. But as soon as I started taking my son into the backcountry, I wanted him to wear a helmet. And so I started wearing a helmet too because what's good for him is good for me. And now I wear one, it's simply standard, okay? We can fix pretty much everything else, but if you suffer a head injury, you're, you're just in a bad place. All right, and it's not avalanches, it's smoke in the trees, it's going off the cliffs and hitting rocks. Um, a colleague of mine actually did go off a cliff and hit the rocks, and it was the first time that year he wasn't wearing a helmet. He ended up with a fractured skull, but he seems to have recovered and is okay. Had he worn a helmet, he would have walked away from that. Okay. Airbags are a really good idea. They're not a magic bullet. This isn't an avalanche course, so I'm not going into it. People ask, no, I don't have an avalanche airbag. The reason I don't have an airbag is because they still don't have a pack big enough uh, to carry all the equipment I need on a bigger day and have an airbag within it. So it's not accessible to me yet. For skis, that's kind of the only thing we haven't talked about yet. Don't get hung up on the gear. If you're just getting started, check out the used equipment shops. They're really quite good. And I went through my guides exams and guided for my first four or five years on a really tight budget. And I would buy used skis. Usually I bought used skis that were uh, ski hill skis, not backcountry skis, but they were the wider all mountain skis, put a touring binding on them, and they were great. I had a pair of skis I paid $100 for, and I skied on them for seven years. They were beautiful. I went out and bought a really nice touring ski after that, and you know what? <laughs> I didn't like it as much. 
Um, it was a really nice touring ski because it was so light, but when I started skiing down, it just didn't play as well. So, especially when you're getting started, you can cut corners. Skins, get a good pair of skins. Um, there are some less than ideal skins out there. I'll stick my neck out a little bit. I use Ascension skins, which are the Black Diamond skis, skins. They're not the smoothest. They're not the nicest skins on the, in, the, in the industry, but they're stupidly tough and they're very reliable. So I'm really happy with them. Uh, there are ways to clean the snow off your skins, and I find I get about five years off a pair of skins before I have to replace them. That's how long it takes me to wear the glue out. Ski crampons are specialized for uh, really difficult uh, snowpacks. Hard, crunchy, you can't get your skis into them. Generally, you're into some pretty pretty tough conditions. Very rarely used, uh, but when you do need them, you need them. Don't run out and buy them. I use them once every two or three years. Ski boots are a tough one. It'd be nice to buy used. I very rarely see that work, though. When I need new ski boots, I literally go to the shop, close my eyes, put on all the different boots until I find the one that just feels perfect. And then I pay whatever it costs me because you can't enjoy your trip if your feet hurt. And your feet are going to deteriorate every day, so if you're out for multi-day tours, it's just going to get worse. And if you're a professional guide or a really avid skier, you know what? After eight or nine days working in a pair of boots that don't fit, um, you're crippled. You really can't walk straight, and it's going to take weeks for your feet to heal. So take your time, get good ski boots. If you're lucky enough to find use that fit, congratulations. But this and transceivers are the only two areas I, I don't cut corners. Everything else is pretty straightforward. Clothing, you know, I'm not going to teach you how to dress. That was your mom's job. But at the end of the day, what I will say is just make sure you don't sweat. If you're out there in ski touring and you can generate a lot of heat, I've been down to a t-shirt if there's very little wind in minus 20, just to let this, the heat escape without sweating my clothing or soaking my clothing. Once your clothing is wet, it is not very effective for keeping you warm. I know they say it is, but it's not. And it's very difficult to dry it out during the day. And then if you get stuck out and you're soaking wet, it's just the coldest, most miserable experience of your life. Let the heat out. Okay. Beyond that, pack. The water bottle I've actually seen to be quite an issue. If you get one of those little water bottles with the, uh, the, 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 the straw or the little tube that you suck through, they don't work. Even when you winterize them, as soon as it gets below minus 5, by the end of the day, the line will freeze. Use a large water bottle and make sure you can get a big mouth. The biggest open wide mouth bottle you can find, those take the longest to freeze. And here's a nice trick. When you've got your water bottle, wrap it in an extra piece of clothing that you have in your pack, flip it upside down, and the top will freeze first. So when you take it out in minus 35, you can actually open it because the Threads haven't been frozen, and you can drink from it, and the ice is on the other end. If you have it standing up and down, the surface will freeze first, and you may not be able to get to your drinking water. If you have a narrow-mouthed water bottle, you probably won't get the water out if it's really cold. Uh, I do like to take a, um, a thermos with me. That's stupidly heavy. For multi-day tours, I never take a thermos. For easy day tours, I love taking a thermos, because it's a real pleasure to have a warm drink. But that's, that's a luxury. Okay. Sunscreen, even on an overcast day, you want sunscreen. Toilet paper is one of those things that you never think you need. But when you do, you uh, will either be so glad you threw that end of a roll in your pack, or the guy next to you is going to sell it to you for five bucks a sheet, and you'll pay it. So take your toilet paper. When I was a teenager, I did a tour. Uh, and I can't believe I did this. I did this overnight tour out to where the Elk Lakes cabin is now. There used to be just an old trapper cabin. And, you know, finished dinner, crawling in. I'm the only person there. It's dark. And I realized i got to go to the bathroom. And then I realized I have no toilet paper. And I ended up tearing up the map, just keeping the section of the map I needed to get home. And the rest was used for toilet paper. So <laughs> it's so much easier to take a little. Personal meds. 
you can't expect people to carry medications in, their, in the sort of the group first aid kit. So if you're a diabetic or if you're like me, you're an asthmatic, carry the meds you need so that you've got them. And also check to make sure what the conditions are with the cold. I think there is an issue with insulin and freezing. There's no concerns with the, the meds I take. And I tell people what I have. So if I become sick or injured and can't talk to them clearly, they know what I've got in my pack and they know why. Also, if you have something like anaphylaxis, uh, I did have to carry an EpiPen for a little while. I would literally take it out and show my group and say, hey, this is an EpiPen. This is how you get it out. This is how you pull the safety off. Just find any soft, squishy point on my body. You can stick it through my clothes and just hold it there for 30 seconds. And then in about a minute, I can tell you why. But I would give them permission and I'd show them what to do. And I'd explain when and why. So technically, there's some legal gray zones there. But in the real world, it's reasonably accepted practice. Go to digging through your buddy's stuff and just start jabbing him with things. But if they tell you what might happen and what they're looking for and what they want you to do, by all means, help your friend out. Repair tools, again, that's in the group kit. Nice to have some repair tools. If you've got something specific, like you need an Allen key for your snowboard, or you've got a specialized binding that has a part that has a history of failing but is easily replaceable in the field, you know, take them along and make sure you've got what you need because it's not fair to expect someone to carry a whole repair kit with every size of uh, driver out there. Headlamps, everyone needs a headlamp. I usually, with my headlamp, is if I'm on a long tour, I put fresh batteries in my headlamp so that I can switch them out with my transceiver if uh, my batteries start getting low on the trip. Because by the time I switch the batteries on my transceiver, there's usually still enough power left in those old batteries that uh, the headlamp will run for half the night if I needed it. So, just something on the side. Okay. And then within the group, you don't need to take this, but the group as a whole should probably... Um, carry some, uh, you know, carry at least one or two of these things, or if you're guided, you can stick it all with your guide because they get paid, but, you know, most of you are going to go out with friends. Take that first aid kit and take one that you're trained to use. Don't take a bunch of stuff you don't know what to do with or that's beyond your skill set, okay? Um, I was up at a lodge and I was going through their first aid supplies and I opened this package and there was a full set of scalpels and syringes and various types of needles for tension for uh, decompressing tension pneumothorax, uh, tracheotomy. <laughs> so I was just looking at this thinking, I am going to hide this from all my staff. And if there's a doctor in the building who knows what they're doing, I'll let him or her know it's available. But no, that was way beyond the scope of the people who had access to this equipment. So just keep it reasonable. Again, repair kit, just a good basic one for the group. Uh, by the way, those ski straps that uh, everyone sells are amazing. They will help you fix a binding. They'll lock you to the ski. If your binding blows apart, you can use them to hold your uh, ski brakes up if the brakes fail. I've uh, What else have I done with these things? I've used them to lash pieces of wood together to build a shelter. They're really versatile. I've got five of them in my pack because um, quite often a guest doesn't have anything and I've strap their stuff up, something blows up, I can fix it, and we can still keep going. They're wonderful. So little stuff like that are really useful, sort of within your repair kit. Um, yeah, you know what? For a basic shelter, I made the one that I use. But, you know, just an old tent fly is fine. Or if you can just find a tarp that's, uh, you know, like three by four meters, that would probably be fine. Just a thin, waterproof nylon tarp. You can use them to uh, wrap people up, protect them from the wind, put together a lean-to, uh, lay them in it, roll, roll it up, drag them if you've got three or four people. It's great. Foam pads are good. You want a ground insulator. I often use my pack. But, you know, if you bring a little foamy along, some of them are really tiny and inflate. That can be quite useful if you have uh, an injury. Wood saw or a snow saw, I deal with. Many of them do both. The bone saw that you can buy at MEC or the other outdoor stores have uh, basically um, the teeth that'll cut wood. And that's great be for two reasons. One, if somebody gets hurt, you can use it to cut uh, the branches down and you pile up just a 
bunch of evergreen branches and that creates really good insulation from the snow so you can put that under your tarp for a lean-to or uh, firewood usually I can break stuff off by hand with uh, for firewood but you can use the saw to start cutting up your firewood if you've got nothing to do during the night um, the other thing it's very useful for is for rescue if you call for help the rescue authority unless you're very close to the road or it's really bad weather is going to come in by helicopter and if you've got a reasonably clear spot that they can land pulling your saw out and taking off all the little branches and the little trees sticking out of the snow will go a long way to increase the safety for the pilot and if they can actually bring the helicopter down and land you need only put the person in the helicopter close the door and they're gone it's wonderful if uh, you've got a bunch of shrubs sticking out of the snow and maybe one or two trees that are in the way the machine can't land it's going to have to long line which is a much more difficult and uh, it is more dangerous it's still an acceptable practice but you, it's a lot more involved if you can clean things up absolutely just they land you put them in they've gone and it's almost like it never happened it's really wonderful so a saw is a really good idea all right uh, I carry a lighter I carry three lighters and they're in my first aid kit I do have some fire starter but it's not brand name Vaseline rubbed on paper or cloth is a great fire starter um, rubber your bike if you have a bicycle tire cut that up they burn really well those are sort of simple fire starters there are commercial ones on the market extra food it's good to have a power bar sitting in your pack so if you do get stuck out longer than you thought you've got some fuel because fuel generates heat for navigation I love paper maps my spouse I took my spouse on the uh, Yoho Traverse this last winter um, in between guided trips and uh, just the two of us went across and I had a paper map and it was so funny because everyone's got these very cool maps on their phone I would pull the map out and I'd be showing her where we're going and people would just congregate because they could see the whole route in good detail in one shot they're nice you don't need them but they're very nice a compass I know we all have phones now I still use a compass for two reasons one if the phone fails I can navigate on a compass and two if you're just using your phone you're probably not building a three-dimensional image of the landscape you're moving through and this is something we've learned more and more with teaching navigation is that people are getting dumber and dumber when it comes to moving through the mountains because their phone tells them where to go and I kid you not I have had to come up to guides who are navigating with their phone and just say we're going the wrong way it's that way and I've taken the time to memorize the map and I've got a compass and I've got the landscapes sort of pre-visualized in my brain and so far I've been on the mark and they hadn't set their phone up right or they weren't using it properly so be careful altimeters they match the compass mine's built into my watch again your phone can probably do this um, reasonably well but if it's cold it's a little more limited uh, GPS very cool you can buy GPS tools or you can just use your phone I just use my phone now there are GPS watches um, they work but they have very small screens and so when you're in difficult conditions like just a storm with heavy winds or heavy snow or both they're hard to work with they're hard to read so again um, the phone works better and the map and compass work really well so Morgan's asking me what's the weight of my day pack with all the gear the truth is I don't weigh my day pack for the simple reason I don't want to know what it weighs it's often a little bit heavier than the guests um, so yeah I am carrying a bit of weight I also tend to carry camera equipment with me but my day pack normally unless I'm doing glacier travel would be probably under 10 kilos maybe up to 10 kilos it's not bad um, but I'm so used to carrying the weight that uh, I actually have trouble skiing without a pack now so we've got all our toys finally let's go skiing shall we and you want to go skiing but where do you go this is always a problem and especially when you're first starting out it's a huge challenge and it's gotten a lot better 
there's several things you can do. There's programs, uh, there's, there's places like YYC, there's the Min Report with Avalanche Canada, and there's lots of other um, sites that'll give you information and tell you where people were and how they thought the experience was. There are clubs. As I said, I'm the lead guide for the Alpine Club of Canada, and they have sections all across the, uh, the country. Uh, the ACC is the largest mountaineering club in North America. We have the largest uh, number of huts of anybody in North America for the mountains. But there's other organizations too. There's uh, the Federation of BC Mountain Clubs. They have a whole collection of organizations throughout BC as well. You can join them. You can get out and you can go. But ultimately, you're going to want to just get out with your friends once in a while. And as you build your time and skills, you should. So Parks Canada developed a system to actually help us decide where and when is it safe to go in the mountains. It's not a perfect system, but it's pretty good. And it's actually an excellent starting point. So I'll let uh, the fellow who invented it, Grant Statham, uh, explain the system. And uh, if you could just let me confirm that the audio is working for you, because I'm going to be using a different audio system. The Avalanche Terrain Exposure Scale, or the ACE scale, was developed by Parks Canada. Um, initially, we developed the system so we could provide uh, park visitors with a, a, a relative scale that would give them a sense of how serious the terrain is that they're going to travel through. So the Avalanche Terrain Exposure Scale system is similar in many ways to uh, existing rating systems for rivers or for rock climbing, where people can get a sense ahead of time if they're up to the challenge or not. And if they're not, then they can look at a list of trips and choose trips that might be appropriate for either the conditions or for their level of training. There's uh, three rating levels in the Avalanche Terrain Exposure Scale. Class 1 is Simple Terrain, Class 2 is Challenging Terrain, and Class 3 is Complex Terrain. So one thing that's uh, unique about the Avalanche Terrain Exposure Scale is that it's based on landscape. So unlike an avalanche bulletin, which changes every day with the snow, we get new snow, the danger goes up. We have a long period of clear weather, the avalanche danger goes down and it can fluctuate all the time. The terrain doesn't change, it's static. So the rating system that we use, um, class one, two, and three, you can expect it to be the same. Simple terrain is generally pretty straightforward, uh, generally not the kind of place where you're gonna find very many big steep slopes. Uh, these are places like uh, trails through the forest, um, fire roads, uh, low angled areas in alpine meadows, places where generally there's almost no avalanche terrain, but there might be a little bit. Um, you might have a cut bank above a river perhaps, or perhaps you're just gonna cross the very bottom edge of a large avalanche path where an avalanche might only reach that area once in 30 years. So the chance of being caught in an avalanche in simple terrain is, is very low. And that's the kind of place where uh, we encourage people who are just learning to go and get their feet underneath them and learn a little bit about the mountains and not worry too much about getting caught in avalanches. Class two terrain is challenging terrain. And uh, this is the kind of place where there is lots of large slopes around perhaps that you can trigger an avalanche on. But the key piece is that you can get around them if you know how. So this is a place where to travel safely, you need to be able to recognize avalanche terrain. You can't travel blindly and assume you'll miss all the avalanche terrain because there's sometimes lots of avalanche slopes around. But the key here is that you have the opportunity to avoid them. So you can choose to ski a steep slope if you want, and there's often really good skiing to be found in class two terrain. Um, but if you got out there and you decided you didn't like it or the conditions were not what you thought, then there's ways you can get around that terrain and safely make it back home at the end of the day. And so it's a place with options. Class three terrain is complex terrain. And uh, that's the place, just as the word says, where it's complex. And the terrain is big and steep. And you're gonna be exposed to avalanche terrain pretty significantly throughout the day. Uh, lots of people travel in complex terrain. It's commonly traveled. A lot of the big ski trips uh, in the mountains are just by their nature in complex terrain. Skiing happens best at, you know, the same kind of slope angles as avalanches. So complex terrain, avalanches, and good skiing all go really well together. 
Um, one thing you'll find about complex terrain is there's not usually very many options in there. So it's the kind of place, if you're going to go there, you need to be prepared to make decisions about crossing avalanche terrain. And your choices are often either to go in it or not. You don't always have a logical way to get around the slope, or perhaps you're going to travel up a very steep valley with multiple avalanche paths that overlap the trail. And so you need to be prepared to travel through those. You can't assume that you'll get around them. If you're going into complex avalanche terrain, then expect to be exposed to big avalanche paths. Okay. Well, that worked. It's nice to see. Um, it's just live streaming is always a little tricky. It's not quite the same as Zoom. So this was a really good system. Basically, once you know the avalanche hazard for a region, you can then go on a list of trips that have been rated in that region and see what is reasonable given the avalanche hazard. And the system works pretty well. It's not perfect, but uh, from 19... 96 to, 2000, 96 to 2007, they gathered uh, data about uh, avalanche accidents. And what they found is people who basically worked within the avalanche train exposure scale um, were having very low rates of uh, accidents if they were following the guidelines that were outlined. So it's not a perfect solution, but it's been a really powerful tool to help us figure it out. And I'll go into it a little bit more because it's about to change. This hasn't gone public yet, but within the, uh, the professional world, um, we know this is coming and it's uh, we're being trained in it so that we can pass it along to you. It'll be out, uh, I believe, next year. They're going to add two more classes to the avalanche train exposure scale. So there's class zero, which is non-avalanche. So what that means is regardless of what the avalanche hazard is, these locations are safe places to ski. So if you just want to go out and you don't want to bring any avalanche gear and you just want to go for a nice tour or a day ski or snowshoeing, this is the place you can go, class zero. And that should be available, that information will be available to you uh, by next winter. There are still places like that and you know, we can tell you where they are, but it hasn't been written up. And then at the other end, they've added a class four. So now it goes zero, one, two, three, and four. And class four is extreme. So really what they've done is they just sort of broken down the complex terrain. And those areas where, and this is literally the definition I pulled from, uh, from Parks Canada, is uh, exposure to very, and I can't spell, very steep faces with cliffs, spines, couloirs, crevasses, or sustained overhead hazard. Uh, no options to reduce exposure. Um, yeah. Ever, not even. Uh, sorry, I was typing this in and I didn't have time to check the, uh, the spelling. So anyways, extreme terrain is pretty full on. If you're going to go ski a major couloir, you have to hike up the thing. You're standing in the couloir, digging out a ledge, putting your skis on, then skiing down. That's extreme. If you're going to go try and uh, ski the north face of Mount Forbes, 45 degrees, top to bottom, big open feature, no escape once you're into it, that's extreme. If you're going to ski the Emile Couloir on Mount Temple, that's extreme. So it really is just taking the far end of complex and giving it another rating. So it's a good system because it allows us to do this. Okay. In simple terrain, it is reasonable to go uh, out on a trail that's rated simple or class one in low, moderate, considerable um, hazard. If the hazard is high, they say extra caution. This isn't an avalanche course, so I'm not going to go into that. But if you understand what the concerns are, then sure, you can consider going in during high hazard because you've got pretty good margins. The only time we recommend you don't go in simple terrain is when the hazard is through the scale. It's an extreme. If you want to go into challenging terrain, which has lots of really good skiing in it, simple and moderate, or sorry, low and moderate hazard, normal caution. Once you get into considerable, you need to start taking extra caution. So depending on your experience and your skills, that's a maybe. And once you start getting into complex terrain, 
you're always into a situation where there are no certainties. And so in low and moderate, it may be reasonable. Gather more information. It's extra caution. Beyond that, you're starting to really push your luck. And there's a real chance that you could, at some point, be in an avalanche event. So it's a nice tool because you take that, and here we are. This is for Kenanaskis, and within their simple Class 1 terrain, there's a whole list of routes here. So you could get out, and if you live in Calgary or Banff or Canmore, uh, Cochrane, it's snowing hard, the wind is howling, the avalanche hazard is through the roof, but you really want to get out. The Chester Lake Trail's a lot of fun. I enjoy it. It's a good place. I teach there a bit, and I've just skied there for fun with my family and friends. Okay, so that's an option. Uh, Ribbon Creek to Ribbon Falls is a nice little tour. Rumble Lake's pretty nice. There's lots of stuff in here that you can go out and still have a nice day and not be exposed to unreasonable hazard. Okay, you're looking to do, you know, some skiing, uh, possibly some good downhill. There's lots of stuff in here. So if the hazard is low or moderate, here's a whole list of tours that are generally pretty reasonable. And Trist Lake actually has some pretty aggressive lines on it. So you want to gain good information. But you know what? There's a lot of good terrain in here to be skiing. And then finally, uh, Class 3 or Complex Terrain. These are some big routes. The Robertson Glacier took my son up there a couple years ago. I can see why it's complex. It's You have to ski up some avalanche slopes. It's got some challenges. But uh, it's a beautiful tour. Mount Joffrey, it's a great peak to climb, but it's a big, open, steep face. And uh, there's really no options. It will probably be listed as extreme when they make that uh, qualification. But again, it's an option once things are stable. So it's a great resource to help us figure things out. Uh, will this be posted on the channel after the live stream? Yes. Yes, you can come back, and this will be on the live stream at the same link. So, basically, the first thing we do when we're trip planning is we need to know the Avalanche Bulletin. So you go to avalanche.ca, and it's not very busy right now. But Avalanche, Avalanche Canada has really been trying to create one-stop shopping. And so there's a lot of information on this little site here. So for Banff National Park, they're not giving a full bulletin yet. But they are telling you the date. It's valid until Monday, November 13th. So until the next major storm cycle. It'll be done on a daily basis once they're into full winter conditions. So early season conditions prevail in the high mountains. Watch out for small wind slabs in the alpine. As they can have serious consequences if you are hit in steep or exposed terrain. Okay. None of this is rated yet because they're not open. But they're giving us some information. And it says, avoid exposure to overhead avalanche terrain during periods of heavy loading from new snow, wind, or rain. So my suspicion is the hazard is probably around moderate in the Alpine. However, if you're out there and you're seeing fairly deep snowpack and or strong winds and heavy snow loading it, you probably should be thinking this is not a good idea if it's steep enough to slide. So it's giving us information. Then we go to Environment Canada, we get the weather bulletin. Environment Canada is a really nice sort of general synopsis. I like it. I actually use it a fair bit. But it's kind of limited because it's got Banff and Canmore. What happens if I'm working out at uh, Bow Summit? Oh, I don't know what the weather's like at Bow Summit. Wait a second. There's another tool we can use. And you guys are probably very familiar with this. But I'll point it out because it is very cool. So this is called Spot Weather. Spot WX. And you just zoom in. There's the Red Deer Field, Lake Louise. So I want to go up to here, right about there. Yep, that's Bow Lake. That's Pito Lake. So this is Bow Summit right there. So once you click and you mark that spot, you'll see that a series of boxes appear. And this is the forecast region for the algorithm. Different algorithms have different forecast regions. And the most accurate, no surprise, 
is the smallest one, this guy right here. This is a one kilometer grid forecast, and that is the most accurate. And then the big green one is, I think it's like half a degree, and that's huge. And which one do you think is more accurate for weather forecasts? When you come down here, I found this quite confusing for the longest time, but here's some information on spot weather um, to apply. The American models don't work very well. They're pretty good, but they're not amazing. The Canadians are really good. We're actually quite respected for this model. Um, Canada's got a, got a, got a world-class weather model. And the most accurate is the 1.5 kilometer resolution. And it really only gives you two-day forecast. So let's take a look at that. That's that small square. And so the calculation was made at 7 a.m. this morning. And basically, this is the forecast for the next 48 hours. The red one is temperature. The green is the dew point, basically when you read 100% relative humidity. And the yellow one is what it actually feels like because of the, uh, the humidity in the air. Okay, so here's the relative humidity right here in blue. And if you go to any specific one, it'll tell you basically temperature, dew point, what it feels like, and the relative humidity. So this gives you current temperatures. It's not exact, but it's actually pretty good. Down below, you have precipitation and clouds. So there's no precipitation expected in the next two days. Clouds are expected to go to basically 100%, and they drop down, and it's not until Thursday mid-afternoon that the sky is clear. And then it builds up again. Here you can see what the winds are expected to do. Don't worry about the pressure too much unless you want to start getting into some forecasting. But um, when you look at the winds, the arrows always uh, start from the way, where it's coming, and of course the end is where it's going. And so what we're seeing initially here are westerlies, because they're starting in the west and they're blowing east. We talk about where the wind is coming from, not where it's blowing to. Okay? And that is how you read the winds. So right now they're westerly for about 24 hours, and then this is cool, and this is only because I'm turning into a weather geek. Look at how the arrows are changing, and they're becoming basically north, or sorry, southerlies, and then south southeast. Same time, the uh, the wind is dying down, and when you come up here, oh, no, it's not there. Um, this is your barometric pressure. It's dropping. There's a different air mass moving in. So the winds are changing. Severe weather indices tell us whether we have stable or unstable weather. That's actually looking at a vertical column of air. Don't go there. Um, this is information that's useful to someone who's doing forecasting. Um, from the local standpoint, what it means is this is probably a pretty reliable forecast and we don't expect any wild weather events coming up because we don't have um, any unstable air masses aloft or don't have them forecast. Cape and Helicity, ignore that. Low level wind, you can look at this and see what the winds are doing up a little bit higher. Okay, the bottom one is the most useful in my mind, which is the same as what we just saw above. If you're getting into the Alpine, this might give you a bit of better sense of what to expect for winds. Just go for the highest one. Um, but it may not be accurate because, again, the topography is going to have a real change. Planetary boundary, surface radiation, again, those are not really relevant for what we're trying to do. But there are spot weather, wonderful tool. And then if you ever want to see what the weather is actually doing at the moment, and I do this a fair bit, is if I want to find out what's going on in the weather, go back to uh, avalanche.ca because they like to put all sorts of stuff in here. Anybody know what the weather's doing up uh, at the Bow Hut right now? I spend a lot of time at the Bow Hut. So I like to know what the weather's doing. This is the Vulture Peak weather station. It's within eyesight of the Bow Hut. A little bit higher, a little more exposed. But the temperatures are pretty similar. There we go. So right now, as of an hour ago, the data is about an hour old. Uh, it's about a minus 12. This wind's moving at 20 kilometers per hour, 
and it's coming from the west, so it's a westerly. The gusts are up to 50k, and the relative humidity is 83%. And this will give you data for the last 24 to 48 hours. So, you know, it's a little cold and nippy up there, but that's... For the bow hut, early winter, that's not too bad. The winds aren't pleasant, but they're not bad. Good information. So Morgan asks if the weather is updated in real time. And no, the weather is not updated in real time. There's about a one hour lag. So what we see on the data, or on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the sites, is usually delayed by about an hour. However, Parks Canada does have it in real time. They use this for uh, the avalanche forecast and also for doing avalanche control work on some of the highways. That's part of the reason why they have the, uh, the stations there. But to be an hour behind really doesn't have much impact on our decision making. So that's actually really accurate for us. Okay, what's next? Okay, yep. So we get the hazard, we use the eight scale, we can figure out where we want to go. So once you've got a, a plan put together, write down where you're going, how many people are there. If you've got an option plan, because you're not sure, put down your option, vehicle, it's license plate, and then leave it with somebody responsible. And what I always tell people is choose the one person who will always miss you, your mother. Okay? Um, in my case, I give it to my spouse. And she still loves me, so I'm in a good position here. Because if I show up late, two things go through her brains. Did he finally screw up, or is he just late again? And if I'm about more than about an hour after the late I told, time I told her to call the wardens, she'll call the wardens. And you know what? She should. That's really good. Because as soon as I get in contact with her, and I tell her, yeah, I'm so sorry, I got lost again, and took us a little longer to find our way out, but we did it, we're all okay. She just calls Parks, and Parks will say, yep, yeah, no problem, because that's their job. They're fine with that. Um, and once my spouse's mother was late, and she hadn't shown up for over an hour, so I took off to go and look for them, because we had their information, and uh, Rachel was getting ready to call Parks. And when I got there, and I found the vehicle, and I found them, and they were okay, you know, I was just like, perfect. We're happy or fine. You want to do that. And don't get hung up about it. You know, it's just what we do to take care of each other. So don't leave this with your binge drinking roommate who blacks out. Leave it with someone who's going to miss you. Okay. And go through your checklist. Make sure you got all your toys. Then just as you're driving out, reassess the weather, the bulletin. Make sure everything's the same because if you plan two days ahead, things can change. And when the trip is over, you know what? Just sit down with your group and talk. How was it? Did everyone feel good about the day? Do we want to go back there? Do we want to up the ante? Do we want to step back? Do we want to make some changes? And just keep working it out. And before you know it, you're just going to have a good group of people. And you're going out regularly and you're doing the things you love. But you got to talk about it because otherwise people don't know and they make assumptions. And that's very often not what actually happens. And then if you want, you can share that information. Okay. And you can go on the min report. So you download this on your phone. That's a whole piece of information about it. And basically what it does, let's see if I can get there, is it creates a pin. So Cirque Peak. Oh, yeah, I know this area. All right, somebody tried to go ski up towards the bow hut. And what'd they do? Okay, Ian West. I know this person. I can't remember how. And they left some information. Oh, so they went ice climbing on Crowfoot North Buttress. The ice quality was okay. There was blowing snow, strong winds, warm, windy. They got woomphing or drum-like sounds or shooting cracks. This is a warning sign, so that's good to know. Small pockets at ridgetop cracking and cross-loaded gully released size one loaded <coughs> by strong westerly. So they're actually saying conditions are touchy. The saving grace is there's not a lot of snow, and therefore they're not seeing big releases. Well, that's not a bad size, size one. So that's good information. And this is why it's nice to use the min, because you actually get some uh, 
some real-time data on what's going on out there. So Mike's asking about the spot, and yes, you're right, Mike. When you use spot weather, it does give you an average. It's not the perfect weather tool, but when you're getting down to a one kilometer grid, it's not bad. Um, I was playing with it the other day and I was using Mount Columbia, which is the highest peak in Alberta, right on the edge of the Columbia ice field. And the one kilometer grid gave me a very different reading than the, basically the 10 kilometer grid for the weather. So there's a huge range in the accuracy, largely because one is calculating for a lower elevation and a different environment. So spot weather does have some issues, but overall it's pretty good and uh, don't walk out there thinking it's bang on, but it'll give you a good reference point. But if you're trying to get the weather temperatures for um, 3,500 meters or 12,000 feet point, and it's, you know, 7,000, well, two kilometers to the valley floor below, yes, there's going to be significant variations in what the unit reads and what it actually is. You're right. Okay. So you can go through the circuit. We've done that. I like to plan my trips and I do it very old school because um, I was trained in navigation back in the uh, 80s. I started applying it in the 70s, learned how to do it properly in the 80s, got examined in the 90s, <laughs> and uh, then GPS came along. But to sit down with a paper map and actually draw out your route and measure the distances and write down uh, reference points can be quite useful. Um, I recognize it's not the way most people like to go today, but if you know how to read contour lines, I can look at this landscape and I can model it in my mind. I can also reference what to be looking for. There's a, there's a, an alluvial fan here, and that's going to be just a little bit higher than the water, very little vegetation. It's going to pull me back in a triangle towards where the creek is. In winter, I'll pick these things up. And then reference, I just handrail along the slope. And there's all sorts of little cues. I'll write down my distances, it'll give me, and my travel times, and work it out. And that helps me pre-visualize where I'm going and get a sense of how long it's gonna to take to get to the Bow Hut. You can do this, nothing wrong with it. I still do on serious trips because it helps me work through. But tools have gotten pretty amazing today. This uh, is the, the Fairy Meadows hut is down here. And I was, uh, well, I'll be guiding it this winter. And I have been in there twice before, but it's been a few years. And uh, the last time was in pretty much a full whiteout for seven days. And so it's nice to be able to get a good sense of what the landscape actually looks at, not just from a map. And so using Google Earth, you can do these incredible three-dimensional real-world flybys. You can see the huts in the bottom right-hand corner as it spins around. And, you know, we've just gotten a sense of what this place looks like, how big the, uh, the glacier is. I think it's the Granite Glacier. How the landscapes connect, where the passes are, and it is a wonderful tool for navigation. Um, I really like it. And satellite imagery is fantastic. When I was going through college and had to do map and photo interpretation, Satellite imagery wasn't even available to us. Uh, we used air photos, which worked pretty well, but they were pretty limited and difficult to access. So this is fantastic. And Peter's asking about a good navigation course. We're not running one this winter, but I haven't asked to develop one for the ACC. And uh, I'm a big fan of navigation. But currently, I cannot honestly say that I know of a really good uh, navigation course that's going on. Um, another feature that's really nice is Keltapo, and I'm just going to introduce you to this. There are other tools out there, um, such as uh, uh, Gaia and Fat Maps, and they're excellent tools. I use Gaia quite a bit actually, but my industry is using Keltapo, and I am using it with work quite a bit. Because Keltapo, unlike the others, is sort of a basic um, GIS software and allows us to do things with layers and overlays that are becoming increasingly sophisticated and potentially quite useful for avalanche um, 
mapping and identification of problems at an industrial or professional scale. So yeah, I focus with this, but that doesn't mean it's better. Um, it's not an easier tool to use. So I certainly uh, love using Gaia because it's so quick and simple. But when it comes to uh, uh, working with complex uh, situations, this actually works pretty well. But let me show you something. So here we are. We're getting in towards the Wapta. And there we are. Zooming in a bit. And let's open this in Keltapo. There we are. Oh, I'm back in the Lyles. Oh, I love this. <laughs> okay. So I was looking at this area earlier. So I don't think they have actually an avalanche train exposure scale rating for going into the Lyles or past Glacier Lake and up towards the glacier in the ice field. So here's a basic map. Let's throw in the contours. Okay. 20 meter. They have 20 meter contours? Wow. Let's see if it can generate it. Maybe not. Okay, let's not worry about that. But you look at this feature and you really can't tell what you're up against. There's a wonderful tool, and this is available in other programs as well, but it's particularly nice um, in Keltapo, is you can use shading. And so, as I zoom down, here's the summer trail. This is flat land. There's no hazard, and I'm a fair distance from these slopes. So I'm pretty safe from any avalanche concerns. Once I get on the lake, this has definitely got a lot of avalanche terrain because if you look down in the terrain, the red is 35 to 45 degrees. That's avalanche terrain. So is the orange. And so red and orange are really serious concerns. I'm here. A huge climax slide might reach me, but I'm not going to trigger it. And unless I'm going in when the hazard is such that natural avalanches can be expected, I'm actually pretty safe all the way through here. Just using a map for an area that's completely unrated. The only problem I'm going to have is getting up this head wall so that I can go and ski up the, into the Lyles. And yet, when I look at this, it's not very steep up along this creek. Oh, yeah! I could work this and come in high. So that's very nice. Alternately, I can also look at coming up here. There's a short section that's not too steep, and then I got a fairly steep head wall, really big steep terrain above me, but I might be able to work this, come around, and through here. I don't know which one is better. They're both going to have concerns, but they clearly indicate options that are viable when I have a fairly stable snowpack. And that will get me up onto the Lyles, and you can ski to the summit of several of these peaks and just boot pack uh, to all but one of them. And they're over 11,000 feet, so over 3,300 meters, or 3,400 meters, I think. So this is a really useful tool for ski touring. It doesn't matter if you're doing something like this or you're going out to the uh, Kootenai Plains. They don't get snow very often, but it's a beautiful area. And you can be looking at, you know, how do you feel about skiing through these areas? Going up to Siffler Falls. Well, there's no significant avalanche terrain anywhere near this area. So, yeah, that's a reasonable trail for me to do when I want to go skiing. Or, you know, if I want to go in towards these areas, if there's snow, how do I feel about going up into Whirlpool or Two O'Clock Creek region? It's a wonderful tool, and it's now available to us, and this is free. Okay. So that's, whoops. <laughs> I have no idea what I just did. Okay. And, oh, geez, I've gone to full. I've, hang on. My computer's jumped my screen resolution. This program won't run in anything larger than uh, 1920 by 1080. And it just jumped to UHD, which is four times larger. So let's change that. Okay. Virtualization uh, system. Computers are lovely, aren't they? One. Yeah. Okay. 
trip planning. Okay, I think we're back in the game. Okay, so other resources you can have to figure out really good tours. This is my favorite, written by a couple of people I really like. Um, Summits and Ice Fields. This is Chick Scott's book, and uh, Chick is one of the great uh, ski tours in North America. He's done some of the biggest and the, the best. However, he's not a kid anymore. He was, I was talking to him last weekend, and uh, he was telling me that he's, he's pushing 80 now. So he's kind of handed this off to uh, Mark Lawson. Mark is a very respected mountain guide who's done quite a few impressive ski tours himself. And so they have one for the Columbias and another for the Rockies. Excellent guidebooks, very well done. Um, all the information in there tends to be very reliable, very accurate, and it's also very complete. Good book. Not like I'm selling it or anything. I'm not, but I really, I really do respect them. This is another uh, set of guidebooks, which is great because it covers a lot of local areas. This is Marcus Barino, and he's got Confessions of a Ski Bum, because he really is a, he's a professional ski bum. And he's written some nice books. I have a couple of them. I enjoy them. But be careful. The one thing I would recommend is, if you're just starting out, this is not a good uh, guidebook to start with, because uh, Marcus is an exceptionally talented skier, and the people he skis with are also as good or better. And so between them... What they consider to be moderate, uh, most people would consider to be fairly aggressive. And what they consider to be fairly aggressive, I'm not sure I can ski. And then when Marcus starts talking about lines that he won't do, they're way out there. <laughs> so it's a good book. But uh, just understand that there are some, there need to be some caveats that it's big terrain he's talking generally, or pretty aggressive lines. Also, the Avalanche Train Exposure Scale is in Summits and Ice Fields. Chick and Mark have uh, rated all the tours they do. It's not in the books I've seen Marcus do. Rogers Pass, if you ever get the chance to go to Rogers Pass, this is basically somewhere between Mecca and Heaven. It's big country, but there are some very reasonable places to go for beginners, although um, there's also a lot of big terrain in there as well. This is really the only practical guidebook for the area, but be careful. They, uh, I don't know if they have changed, but they were not putting in the Avalanche Train Exposure Scale either with their tours, and they weren't doing much for defining easy, moderate, and challenging routes. Some of their routes are very reasonable. Some of them are way out there. So take it with a grain of salt and uh, do a little more research than just flipping to the page that looks really cool. Because it is really cool, but it's big. Uh, however, having said that, you go to Rogers Pass, You'll never want to ski anywhere else, unless it's nearby. It's so good. So those are kinds of your resources. And then, you can uh, go to the Min, which you've already done. And there's also the Mountain Conditions Report. This is similar to all the other sites that have uh, postings, with one distinct difference, is you can't um, post on it. The only people who can post are certified uh, guides. And the assumption is that these are individuals who should be giving pretty reasonable, unbiased information. For the most part, it's true. But uh, at the same time, take everything with a grain of salt. But this tends to be a good resource, but it also tends to have less information because there's just fewer guides than there are uh, the general public getting out for a ski. But it's a good resource, too. If you do want to go to Glacier National Park, there is a winter permit system in place. I'm not going to go into it too much, but just do a search. Glacier Park Winter Permit. Uh, it's an online process. Please go through it uh, because much of the terrain they've opened to skiers does get some, is exposed to uh, explosive work with uh, con avalanche control for the highways. The stuff we're skiing is not controlled. It is a wild landscape, but um, they let us ski there. When they need to do control work, they close the area, and we need to stay out. And we have to honor this system, because if we don't, um, they will start uh, basically closing areas off to the public. They don't want to blow people up. 
So we have to understand the system and respect it. Parks has done a really nice job of making it accessible to us. And for the most part, they're very, very reasonable requests they make. And if we play the game, we will have access to incredible terrain. But just remember, the area may be open. That doesn't mean it's safe. It just means it's open. You will not be, ex you will not be blown up by artillery. That's all it means. Um, and then there are places that are simply open permanently because there is no risk of avalanche control work, um, no risk of artillery fire in these regions. So they're open regardless. So there's always places you can go. Okay, the only other guy is the main channel, or well. All right. So there's a question as to whether this program will be on YouTube, and the answer is yes. The uh, live stream is available on YouTube at the same link. Okay. Moving on. So I'm kind of wrapping up. This was really kind of a general introduction. I didn't want to get into all the nitty gritty about uh, you know, um, movement skills and this sort of thing, because you want to learn that in the field. Learn that with friends. Or the Alpine Club of Canada has a program called BIT, which is basically a uh, beginner's introduction to ski touring. Don't ask me how that becomes BIT, but that's the acronym. And it was developed by uh, Rod Plasman and uh, many of the members with the Rocky Mountain section um, expanded it over time. The ACC National is in the process of building sort of a, a course book and resources so that other clubs, other sections, can run the BIT program as well. And that is exactly what it's for, is to get people out introduced to ski touring. It runs over four days. Three of them are ski touring in the backcountry. Um, if other organizations like uh, BC Federation of Mountain Clubs is doing this, fantastic. Let me know and I'll be happy to share that. Um, but that's where you want to go for those resources. For avalanche skills, take an AST one. If you don't have access to an AST pro course, and again, this is an, a, uh, an ACC issue. I was just talking with people in the Saskatchewan section, or no, they had a different name, the Great Plains. I'm not sure. Uh, which is a little difficult to find an avalanche instructor. We're going to be running uh, a virtual program in conjunction with volunteers, not to produce an AST course, but an and almost AST. The instructor will be myself, and I will provide you with the AST1 curriculum, but then the field work will be done by volunteers who are following a pretty well-defined guideline so that while it's not an AST course, it's as good as we're going to get until people are able to get into the mountains for an extended period of time, or someone out there with the proper level of training starts working in these more remote regions. So just something to keep in mind. And I'm going to finish with a little tour. It's something to build up to, but uh, this is something we, uh, we produced uh, for Discovery Channel years ago. But it gets you up on the Columbia Ice Field and lets you see kind of what the potentials are. Geologically speaking, Few natural forces can alter a landscape more dramatically or rapidly than a glacier. Millions have visited the Athabasca Glacier, but few realize that it is a tiny fraction of the entire Columbia ice field. A crucial regional reservoir, the ice field feeds into three oceans, the Atlantic, the Arctic, and the Pacific. To experience this area requires several days on foot or skis to penetrate this polar landscape. over 60 square miles and surrounded by massive peaks, including the highest peak in Alberta, 
Mount Columbia. The ice field is a reminder of the great ice sheets that once buried Canada and the northern United States. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, folks. That's pretty much everything I have. If you have any questions, please feel free to uh, bring them through on the chat. And uh, the ACC has got a full slate of winter programs are running this summer, uh, courses and tours. You're welcome to check it out on the website. But otherwise, uh, I hope to see you in the mountains, and I hope you have a good winter. That's what my son was for. <laughs> now he's 20 and in university. It's terrifying. Okay. It was my pleasure. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I love that shot because he's just staring at his hand. <laughs> now he could probably carry me. All right. Thank you, guys. My pleasure. And with that... I think I'm going to go have some dinner. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. <laughs>